Baby reindeer. Well, we're going to take a look behind the curtains that Richard Gadd hung. Greg, wants to tell us about the videos we're going to watch? So there are a couple of videos you're going to take clips from. One is an AP interview. The other is a British TV interview. And both have some good information. Essentially, it all begins with one random act of kindness. Yes. And then as it develops through, you can see in hindsight, knowing what's going to happen, mm. all the little mistakes that your character makes oh, yeah. along the yeah. way. <laughs> Is that kind of what happened in real life too? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. The, 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 it did all start with a drink on the house. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew almost immediately, that's, that's, that's why so much is made about that look up in episode one, the, you know, that look up that Martha does. Uh, that, that's, that is very reminiscent of what happened. I almost knew the second I'd done that, I'd made that gesture that, oh, something's brewing here. Yeah. I didn't think it was going to get to the extent that it did get, yeah. but... It definitely started in that moment, yeah. And just, I mean, in terms of the experience of having somebody who was stalking you, how bad did it get? Oh, it got, it got pretty bad. It got pretty relentless. At one stage, it was like an assault on all, all senses across all media, emails, phone, everything. Uh, it, it, it felt like a barrage, a constant sort of 24-7 issue. And you felt, I think one of the things that I get from the series is that you understand that you have a responsibility within that as well. This, mm. you, you had, yeah. at certain periods, as Kat was saying, you had done things that, that perhaps when you look at it, you think, maybe I encouraged some of this and I shouldn't yeah. have. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, want to, I didn't want to do a sort of, it, it felt too easy to do a cup of tea and, oh, oh is, is an, aren't I such a victim? It, it didn't feel me. that way. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. It, it didn't feel that way in life. I, I indulged it. I was in a bad place. I made stupid errors. I sort of felt like I needed uh, someone to, to give me attention in a way because my, my confidence was rock bottom. And I wanted to get that in. I wanted to show the nuances of the human condition, really. I wanted to show that people are a mixture of good and bad. And I think stalker stories usually tend to be one person's good, one mm. person's bad. And I wanted to kind of get away from that. All right, Chase, what do you got? Let's talk about artists. Artists very often draw from real life experiences and creating a lot of their work. And this can sometimes blur the lines to the point where there's a genuine struggle between personal identity and artistic identity. And this can be pretty damn corrosive to confidence and self-esteem. So this is a shocking amount of vulnerability uh, here that I did not expect to see going through these clips this morning. And I think our world is so full of people being fake and trying to be perfect uh, that things like this and even the whole baby reindeer show are a breath of fresh air. And if you think back to the Johnny Depp trial, you'll know why everybody loved him a lot more after everything was over, just because it wasn't fake. It was kind of open, raw. It was really raw. And let me just say, I don't think that people are deliberately and knowingly uh, being fake uh, all over the place. I think it's a trend that's kind of metastasizing from a global crisis of losing self-identity and self-awareness. But right when she says, is that what happened in real life? We've got a cluster. We've got a behavioral cluster. Maybe you guys can add to this one. Uh, we've got hesitancy, a loss of fluency, a cough and throat clearing. It's a cluster of behavior. Maybe there's more that I missed. Uh, but it's different, very different from his overall baseline, how he normally behaves. Uh, but it's not gigantic from what I saw. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Let me add one more, if I can get my picture back on. Okay. Let me, <laughs> let me, add, let me add one more. Oh, man, he curls so his fingers. He talks confidently with his fingers expanded and doing all that when he starts off, even when he does that brow up for request for approval. And his chin down as he admits he made mistakes. But when she hammers him and goes after that one question, his fingers curl in. They move back. It's like you're pulling your feet in to keep somebody from running over them. It's a powerful thing. And then he goes back to confident speaking after that. So I'll just add to your cluster and then hand it to Mark. Uh, yeah, look, I think what we've got here, to your point, Chase, is really an artist's artist. Uh, he, he He's not really an entertainer in much of a sense, but he is a true artist. And we'll see that come out in the videos that we watch. Uh, you're absolutely right. Is that what happened in real life too? We get the cough. We get, yeah, absolutely. We get stammering. The stammering is outside of the baseline of an English stammer. You might notice sometimes when I speak, I have a, a, a stammer. I just did it then. And, and it's quite an English 
thing. You'll find a lot of English people do that. We kind of learn to do that as a, as a placeholder for our thoughts. His goes way beyond what would be normal for somebody British, because uh, I believe he's Scottish. So somebody British in this situation. Um, and then he also says, I felt like uh, it, it felt like a barrage, a 24-7 issue. It felt like a barrage. So really, he should be saying, if it were absolutely true, it was a barrage, 24-7. But he says it felt like a barrage. So we, we're going to have to weigh up all the time the, I think, what he calls the emotional truth of this story and what is accurate and factual about it. And I think this is the big issue with, with this and an issue um, in a realm of of entertainment when what he's producing is artists' art at a really high level, and it doesn't quite fit what we expect from entertainment or certainly even documentary. Scott, what do you got on this one? For me, everything looked fairly authentic. Everything looked real. Everything looked the way it should look. And uh, I'm not I'm not seeing deception in there. I agree with you when, when you're talking about... Um, it may be he may be not as good of an entertainer as he may be under the, under the impression he has. That would be the the idea I have. But I think he's probably we're seeing someone who's really excited being being interviewed, and this is the first time. This is the most heat he's ever had on him. So I think everything. I think it looks good for what's happening to me. Essentially, it all begins with one random act of kindness. Yes, and then as it develops through you can see in hindsight knowing what's going to happen mm. all the little mistakes that your character makes oh, yeah. along the yeah. way <laughs> but is that kind of what happened in real life too <clears throat> yeah absolutely the the, the, the the it did all start with a drink on the house mm -hmm. um and i knew almost immediately that's 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 why so much is made about that look up in episode one the you know that look up that Martha does. Uh, that that's that is very reminiscent of what happened. I almost knew the second I'd done that, I'd made that gesture that oh something's brewing here. Yeah. I didn't think it was going to get to the extent that it did get, yeah. but it definitely started in that moment. Yeah. And just I mean, in terms of the experience of having somebody who was stalking you, how bad did it get? Oh, it got it got pretty bad. It got pretty relentless. At one stage, it was like an assault on all all senses across all media, emails, phone, everything. Uh, it 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 felt like a barrage, a constant sort of twenty four seven issue. And you felt, I think one of the things that I get from the series is that you understand that you have a responsibility within that as well. This, mm. you, you had, yeah. at certain periods, as Kat was saying, you had done things that, that perhaps when you look at it, you think, maybe I encouraged some of this and I shouldn't yeah. have. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, want to, I didn't want to do a sort of, it, it felt too easy to do a cup of tea and, oh, oh is, is an, aren't I such a victim? It, it didn't feel me. that way. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. It, it didn't feel that way in life. I, I indulged it. I was in a bad place. I made stupid errors. I sort of, felt like I needed uh, someone to, to give me attention in a way because my, my confidence was rock bottom and I wanted to get that in. I wanted to show the nuances of the human condition really. I wanted to show that people are a mixture of good and bad and I think stalker stories usually tend to be one person's good, one mm. person's bad and I wanted to kind of get away from that. Did you ever find out why she walked into the pub that day, that first day when she walked in and sat at the bar? No, but I've questioned it all the time yeah. because there was a distress or, or something yeah. had happened. Um, and sometimes I, I question, was it the end of her stalking relationship with someone else and the beginning of a stalking relationship with me? I guess I'll never know, but I, I have often asked myself that, mm. actually. Yeah. yeah. How was it to relive all of that again? Because... In one way, it must be terribly distressing and it almost takes you back to those, you know, there was over 41,000 emails you're talking about, listening to the voicemails, all that. It must be distressing. But in another way, there must be a slightly empowering moment about almost taking control of the situation and yeah. turning it into something positive. Yeah, I think so. I, th I think that's, that's what I've got most out of out of art and in, in my life and writing and doing all these things. It has this uncanny sort of ability to sort of dwarf the magnitude of themes in your life. And mm. when you're struggling with things and everything's on your shoulders and tight in your chest, just getting out there, writing it down, putting it into something. Mm. It's, it's, it's been the best therapy for me. It's kind of been a lifesaver. So. There's something about being a comedian though and being a writer and writing about your own experience that you have to put yourself out there. Yeah. I wonder how much you've changed because you were just being generous and nice to this person 
and it's had such a massive impact. Yeah. Has it changed yeah, who you are as a person? Are you more guarded about interaction with people? Oh, for sure, I think. Yeah, yeah I think, I, I, think I, I definitely think twice now. I'm definitely like out of the, because I, I was going through such a chaos of trauma back then. I, I definitely feel, it was a long time ago now, I definitely feel I'm a, more out of that. And mm. I, I, things, I, I hope and I like to believe that things would play out differently now. Mm. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I'm just going to look at the linguistics of this, the, the ideas that he's putting forward, the terms that he's using, because it's unusual for a show of this sort. This is, I think, this morning. It's meant to be kind of light and, and easygoing. And there he is talking about art, therapy, you know, rather than entertainment. So art as therapy. Uh, he mentioned earlier uh, it, it, on in this interview about the cathartic effect of this, uh, that in the in the traditional senses is emoting fear and pity in the drama that that comes. He says it's a lifesaver as well. It was a lifesaver writing this stuff down. There's just a general sense of chaos and trauma going on here, which isn't what we'd usually expect from somebody on that couch talking about a piece of entertainment that they've created with Netflix. So we can see this is hitting a whole bunch of levels that we're not used to uh, in daytime TV and that couch. Again, we've got an artist's artist there who has zero problem putting across that this is art as therapy, cathartic and a, and a lifesaver for him. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? For me, what's interesting is when you ask him a question that doesn't require deep thought or for him to conjure something, he's pretty good eye contact, pays really close attention. Just recalling what was it like, he can do that pretty easily. But when you ask him a question, his eyes drop down into his left. Now, people would think that means he's being deceptive. No, he's wordsmithing, thinking of what to say and doing it. And he's clear and fluid until he gets to that point, And then he pauses and you can hear his brain working. You can hear the mechanics of what he's thinking as he walks through. When they say... The 41,000 emails, there's no discomfort in his face whatsoever. When that flashes back to him, he looks like, yeah, so 41,000. However, there's a nonverbal pause when his head goes down, when when they say, you were just being nice to the person. There's a pause and that head drops. I think he's hoping they'll keep moving, and they do. I would stop right here and say, is there a reason your head just dropped when I said that? I'd poke and say, you were just being nice to her, weren't you? Was something else happening? Is there another reason where you're going to, who knows? Are you going to make fun of her? Did you think it was good for your comedy act? Don't know. But I would poke and give him a reason to answer my question because he just gave me a signal that I need to pay attention to. And then he goes back into that change of cadence. He's halting as he goes into the trauma speech. That gives you, he says something about, I was in a low point in my life, all this trauma, boom, boom, boom. He's feeding you source leads. If I were interrogating a person or talking to a person sitting at a bar and they said this, I go, well, let's talk a little bit about that. Did that impact how you dealt with this woman? Did you do something? Now, somebody's going to say, you're beating up the victim. No, I'm not talking about beating up the victim. I want to understand what happened. Did he do something that caused her to believe there was more going on there was, would be my only question. When asked that, I would ask a lot of questions around it to figure out what actually happened. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, that this chin drop, head drop maneuver is something that we do automatically. Greg, you really touched on it. But it's kind of programmed into us as mammals. I've got a dog here. And I've got another dog right here. And when those dogs feel like they're in trouble or they've been digging through the trash and I come home from the grocery store, the first sign that I know something's off is their heads are down. They're putting their heads down. This is something that's just uh, almost so universal that it's uh, mammalian. Now, the interviewer mentions these 41,000 emails, which seem to to me, to be exaggerated based on the interview that we looked at with the Martha, per Martha person and, and Pierce Morgan. He doesn't get a chance to answer this question, and I wish that they would ask that they did. Maybe they will in the next couple of videos. But so far, the behavior is honest. Uh, what I think is in what he's saying, but keep in mind, he's not being asked any direct questions questions. So he is able to steer the conversation in the places where he's most comfortable. So remember that the quality of the observable behavior is always a result of the quality of the questions. And obviously this 
uh, morning show, Mark, like you like you said, this morning show isn't the in the business of this type of content. It's made for people to kind of hear as secondhand smoke while they're getting ready or cooking breakfast or something and getting ready to go to work. Uh, but that's what we're seeing here. Scott, what do you got? I, I I agree with y'all, and I think you're right, Mark. I think what's happening is we're we're looking at a guy who doesn't know how to do interviews yet. This is his first time really on the on the you know out on the ice where he's having to to talk to to morning people. When you talk to morning TV, like you were saying, Chase, that's a heck of a lot different than talking to to the evening TV people. It's a whole lot. The interviews are a whole lot different because you're really not sitting there watching TV. You're listening to it as you're getting ready. You're doing other things. You know, I, that'd be my impression. But I, I think as, as if his career continues, I think we'll see his interviews get better. He just doesn't know. He doesn't have an understanding of what he's in yet. He doesn't understand this is the morning interview and you you do one like this there and you do another type of interview for the, the later interviews. So I think it's just his, uh, I hate to say amateurish. It's not amateurish. He just, he's an amateur in that, in that world, in that, in that arena there. Did you ever find out why she walked into the pub that day, that first day when she walked in and sat at the bar? No, but I've questioned it all the time the because there was a distress or, or something yeah. had happened. Um, and sometimes I, I question, was it the end of her stalking relationship with someone else and the beginning of a stalking relationship with me? I guess I'll never know, but I, I have often asked myself that, mm. actually. Yeah. yeah. How was it to relive all of that again? Because... In one way, it must be terribly distressing and it almost takes you back to those, you know, there was over 41,000 emails you're talking about, listening to the voicemails, all that. It must be distressing. But in another way, there must be a slightly empowering moment about almost taking control of the situation and yeah. turning it <clears throat> into something positive. Yeah, I think so. I think, I think that's, that's what I've got most out of out of art and in, in my life and writing and doing all these things. It has this uncanny sort of ability to sort of dwarf the magnitude of themes in your life. And mm. when you're struggling with things and everything's on your shoulders and tight in your chest, just getting out there, writing it down, putting it into something. Mm. It's, it's, it's been the best therapy for me. It's kind of been a lifesaver. So. There's something about being a comedian, though, and being a writer and writing about your own experience yeah. that you have to put yourself out there. Yeah. I wonder how much you've changed because you were just being generous and nice to this person. And it's had such a massive impact. Yeah. Has it changed yeah, who you are as a person? Are you more guarded about interaction with people? Oh, for sure, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I think I, I definitely think twice now. I'm definitely like out of the... Because I, I was going through such a chaos of trauma back then. I, I definitely feel... It was a long time ago now. I definitely feel I'm a, more out of that. And mm -hmm. I, I, think, I, I hope and I like to believe that things will play out differently now. Mm. It is another level. I mean, the play, I think I performed to about 250 people a night. This is to what's Netflix subscriber count these days? About 260 million, 270 million or something. So, you know, yeah, it's pretty daunting. I go through sort of occasional bouts of uh, giddy excitement and then occasional bouts of nerves and, oh, God, I really hope people like it. Uh, so it's a whole thing. It's a whole mix of emotions at once. Yeah, it is a true story. I, I was taught for a large um, number of years and it was a huge a whole ordeal. And yeah, and, and, and I, yeah, and, and so, yeah, the, the story is based in, in truth for sure. All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so look, yeah, it is another level. He's moved this show from uh, Edinburgh and I think maybe off West End to millions and millions of, of viewers. Not that there's anything wrong in 250 people a night. Uh, I think it was maybe in the Soho Theatre or something like that, or in Edinburgh, probably even a few less people. But I just want to show the transition that this work has made and therefore the transition to your point earlier scott early point scott the transition that he's having to make as a performer an artist and potentially an entertainer um though i think he's probably more of a performer and an artist uh, before any of those things the shift that he's having to make around this it is a true story he says it is a true story and then there's a massive lack of fluency or or anything coming out of his mouth and this then uh, morphs into it's based in truth for sure it's based in truth for sure well that's very different from it's a true story and art very much will be based in truth, certainly emotional truths for sure. But is art ever, is really great art ever really factual? 
well, I mean, take a look at a Picasso and find me anything factual about about that. Have a look at a Damien Hurst and find me something factual about any of those dots. Uh, no, it's often not factual, but it will, if it's great, will absolutely be based in some of the harshest truth. Greg, what do you got on this one? Rather than repeat exactly the same things you just said, that is based on a true story. It is a true story. And that's a that's a gradual admission of truth, incremental admission. What I would do is just keep asking questions and taking it apart. Oh, is it true? It's a true story. Okay, good. But we see his blink rate increase and that change in cadence you're talking about, loss of fluency. And then he goes back to based in truth for sure and makes good eye contact when he says that. So we think that's probably closer to the truth. And we'd put aiming stakes and work our way in between those two. The reason we want to do that is because even now, this guy can't remember what the truth is, I guarantee you, because he's written this thing, it's been rehearsed, he's done it. He's lived probably as much in the studio, lived the same exact situation as he did in real life. So his memories now are tainted by that. We always talk about your memory is not the original memory, it's the edited memory. I've done two really big reenactments or uh, simulations of interrogation exercises, one for history, one for UK4, called the Guantanamo Guidebook. In both of those, we wrote a scenario for these people to have to go out and physically do things like dead drops and that. And the reason is because what people live, they get more tactile senses they can remember. And because we can read the body language and they're lying, as opposed to if a person just re reads something and regurgitates it. So the first time you get your hands on them, you separate them. Chase, we call it segregated in the military. You separate them from everybody else so they can't contaminate each other's information. And you only give them one time to tell the story before you start taking it apart. I think this is what... They missed the opportunity because they're not doing follow-up questions, and they didn't put aiming stakes and say, is it true or is it partially true? Is it based on the truth or is it truth? Chase, what do you got? I'm not on mute anymore. What an opportunity <laughs> missed. So speaking of Netflix shows, Stranger Things, another great Netflix show, huge blockbuster for Netflix, also based in truth. Something called MK Ultra. if you want to go look that up. But it, it's a true story as he starts out, and it's based in truth at the end of this clip. So when he's saying, yeah, it's a true story, it's a huge deviation from baseline. So let me tell you what his behavioral baseline is. And it's even the same baseline in the videos of him online from nine years ago that I was able to find uh, this morning. There's down left eye accessing. This is his baseline to inter what we call internal dialogue, talking to yourself, mulling things over, eye contact when he's answering questions, never using an upward glance while he's speaking. He breaks from all of this with eye closure during the beginning of the answer, a dismissive hand gesture. You can barely see like right down here off camera uh, toward the bottom of the frame. And then his eyes uh, stay looking upward the whole time. His blink rate goes up into the 50s, which is a stress indicator. We blink more often when we're stressed. And he has partial eye closure. Uh, so if you think about a predator coming near you and you're trying to be calm, but you need to keep that predator in your vision the entire time, you're going to do, uh, most mammals will do partial eye closure, where I'm still wetting the eye, but I'm not closing it all the way. That's what we're seeing right there. This is a large enough cluster for me to say he is very uncomfortable with his statement, which lets me know his body is disagreeing with what his mouth is saying. Scott. I thought what was interesting is just like the, the uh, Netflix show of Baby Reindeer. At the first, he says it's real. And then at the end, he says it's based on uh reality or it's it's yeah. based on truth it's true and it's based on truth so you guys covered everything else and it won't make it boring and pretend to know everything else about it oh mark that was beautiful man yeah i mean nice. uh the pen mouth maneuver i'm just i'm just good that's you know it's this pro <laughs> you got me on that i can't deny it. i'm not going to deny it it Your works got I mean, me. look at this yeah you see brilliant it is another level i mean the play i think i performed to about 250 people a night this is to what's Netflix subscriber count these days, about 260 million, 270 million or something. So, you know, yeah, it's pretty daunting. I go through sort of occasional bouts of uh, giddy excitement and then occasional bouts of nerves and, oh, God, I really hope people like it. Uh, so it's a whole thing. It's a whole mix of emotions at once. Yeah, it is a true story. I, I was thought for a large um, 
number of years and it was a huge a whole ordeal and yeah and 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 uh, yeah and and so yeah the the story is based in in truth for sure um you're very honest about um your own kind of flaws um mm. in in the situation and stuff like that do you do you worry about people judging you <sighs> yeah i do but 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 i i think my my fear of making disingenuous art is is greater than than that uh i think um I think there's a version of the show which I'll just be honest. I've I, I sometimes the fear can grip you sometimes, and you, I just offer a cup of tea and oh, isn't my life? I've done this wonderful gesture, and this <laughs> this person just ruins it. Wasn't I so nice? The reality of the situation situation was that I was I was very um, I was in an extremely bad place, and I was trying to take any comfort I could take, and I found that that was more artistically interesting to explore. Than, than kind of a, a, a maybe more simplistic narrative of of that was just poor me, poor me, poor me kind of thing. Um, I think the second you start to write from a disingenuous place, the second an audience sniffs it out, and and it's why I've always tried to adhere to sort of radical honesty in in all the work that I've that I've done. All right, Greg, what do you got? Interesting. I see a pupil flash. We don't see those very often, but you see a minor pupil flash in him, which means his pupils are dilating and taking more light and then closing. Some of that could be related to lighting, but not likely considering we see his eyes constantly going there. That's usually a sign of stress. And we see people under really high duress, their pupils may do this. The closest you probably will ever come to, to that is when somebody's been in an auto accident or something like that. In my tell, seer days, tell that, that story. Tell that story yeah. about the so there's a thing that can happen to you when you get to adrenal fatigue, and there's a term for it, and I'll forget it, so I won't quote it. But what happens is you push this person to the point that their body cannot take any more input and the, and the being survive. So what happens is their pupils will dilate from stress, but then start to flash, really flash. And they'll move a bunch of times. And that's the predecessor I saw to people balling up in the fetal position in the floor in my days of teaching resistance to interrogation. Chase, you've been through it. You know how much stress it is and how much adrenaline it puts you through and that kind of thing. Lots of studies done on it because it is the most, the single most stressful thing there is. One interesting note we found there is that when people were under duress, when they were under duress being questioned in this seer compound, they could not remember the faces of the people who were doing things to them. Could not remember, not in their conscious mind. We did lots of experiments in their, you know, somewhere in their subconscious, I'm sure it's there. But that's not the way your brain lays down memories. When you're under high duress, it lays down memories in a different place than it does when you're sitting eating Cheetos on your couch. So as people splash, when he says that I did something nice, then his cadence changes and he goes into the reality of the situation and breaks eye contact, starts to ramble about something that really doesn't matter. The most important things he says here, however, are I was in a bad place and I take comfort from any place I could take. And use that word twice, very strong uh, emphasis on the word take. And he raises his brow, like, do you get me? I would certainly lean into this. Now, I heard him say in the other interview something. He paused when they were saying you just did something kind. Here, when he says he did something kind, he overstates again. He's got a lot. This would make me want to lean in and say, did you do something that would make her think something else was going to I would just follow up just like I did in that first one and follow because what he also does here is he uses a shielding word. Now, you always everybody's got filler words, transition words. He uses the word and 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 the reason he goes and long is because there's a pause where this person could easily ask more details. And by using and as a long spread word in between the two sentences, it gives him time to think without giving her time to interrupt. It's a powerful tool. People use it all the time. So my own, I would lean into him right here and just say, come on, man, what does that mean, take? Use that word awfully strong. What did you do? What did you take from her? What did you do to her? Again, this is beating up the victim, but we also know that he's very careful with the way he uses words. And the last thing I'll say is he talks about choosing the artistic path rather than the poor me path. Chase, what do you got? I'll tell you, I don't remember any faces from Sears School. Nobody it's, does. It's a simulated experience, but about 90 minutes into it, and it's several days long, you you do not anymore realize that you're in a simulation. That is gone. Uh, so there's so much stress that the, like, I'm pretending thing out the window. It is, it's horrifying, terrifying. 
I don't remember faces, but I remember arms and hands of every yeah. one of them. Uh, so I think when he's talking about disingenuous art, he's referring not to the facts, but the emotional reality, which we've been talking about, and the truthful display of his personal flaws, which I think is amazing to see. Uh, I wish more people were like this. And I, I think other people enjoy this, too. So I think he's being mostly honest here. And I actually like his quote uh, about the fear of disingenuous art being greater than the fear of judgment. I think that is I think it's beautiful. I may make a bumper sticker out of it and sell it in our merch store. <laughs> Archer. If you could do that uh, not disingenuously, that would be a work of genius. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, look, for me, it's the most important part of that clip is the fear of making disingenuous art. Because, again, it just labels him as the artist's artist. Uh, you know, he's an interesting character. He's not come through all the usual channels for a writer of his caliber. And he clearly is an extraordinary uh, writer. I dare to say the word brave because, you know, everybody, oh, it's such brave writing. But I mean, he really has hit the nerves of the world with this piece. It's an extraordinary piece, uh, which he says is being done through radical honesty, which doesn't mean uh, necessarily factual accuracy. Radical honesty is, doesn't have to be linked at all to factual accuracy. And I think the whole, I mean, one of the reasons this uh, show has become huge is you have a, a, another human, <laughs> this, uh, this potentially stalker woman, most likely stalker woman, I would, I would hedge my bets, um, who, who, when you have her there, she is factually accurate as a human being. It's like, she's real. That's the real thing. And then you've got his show, which people were presuming was as real as her, and yet it's not. It's an artistic expression. People are finding it very hard to put the two things together in, in any kind of way and getting in all kinds of trouble around it. Anyway... Radical honesty, I would agree with, doesn't mean it's factually accurate. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? Right. Speaking of radical honesty, I think what might have happened here, this is dawning on me after listening to you guys say all this, uh, when Paul Ekman was asked to uh, help with that show, Lie to Me, and the character was based on him, the guy Cal Lightman, I think was his mm -hmm. name, was based on um, Ekman, Paul Ekman. They had him on the set. And he would say, they would say, well, we're going to do this and this. Is that the way it would happen? And he would say, and he's talked about this, is how I, I know this because I heard him talk about it. He'd say, no, that's not the way that works. He'd go, well, we're going to do it anyway. And they would do whatever it was anyway. Maybe he was going with his radical honesty thing and making sure everything was right. The Netflix was trying to make it more palatable for viewers and said, we're going to add this, this, and this. Let's make it do this, this. Maybe he just agreed to that because... He's in a, a, at the time a quote unquote. Uh, I don't want to say a nobody in it, but he's not. He doesn't have a lot of of clout in that business yet, so he just had to go along with it. Maybe that's what's happened here. Maybe he's maybe he's tried to to do everything he's talking about from the artist's perspective and be a true artist. But they went ahead and said, "Well, why we're going to change these things right here, even though he well, this didn't happen. Well, it's going to be better for." T and they talk him into it. I think maybe that's what what we've. What's what's happened in this case, maybe? All right, we good? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll give you that one, Greg. Um, you're very honest about um your own kind of flaws um mm. in, in the situation and stuff like that. Do you do you worry about people judging you? <laughs> yeah, I do. But 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 I I think my my fear of making disingenuous art is is greater than than that. Uh I think um I think there's a version of the show which I'll just be honest. I've I, I sometimes the fear can grip you sometimes, and you, I just offer a cup of tea and oh, is it my life? I've done this wonderful gesture, and this <laughs> this person just ruins it. Wasn't I so nice? The reality of the situation situation was that I was I was very um, I was in an extremely bad place, and I was trying to take any comfort I could take, and I found that that was more artistically interesting to explore. Than, than kind of a, a, a maybe more simplistic narrative of of that was just poor me, poor me, poor me kind of thing. 
Um, I think the second you start to write from a disingenuous place, the second an audience sniffs it out. And and it's why I've always tried to adhere to sort of radical honesty in, in all the work that I've that I've done. All right, we just broke down the body language of Richard Gadd. Let's see what you guys think. Mark, what do you think? What have you seen? Yeah, for me, very simple. What we have here in Gadd is just a very earnest artist. That's all. Very earnest artist. Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, what I actually think is it's a very earnest artist, Greg. Right? <laughs> what I think is he's not hiding anything. They're just not looking. They didn't ask the right questions or probably would have gotten the right answers. Scott? I'm going to go along on this one. No, I agree with you. I think we're we're looking at an, an honest uh, artist who who is the guy trying to be an artist. That's what he's trying to do. And I think he's pulling it off. I think he's doing a good job of it so far. All right, fellas, this is another good one, and we'll see you next time. So what do you got?